Welcome to Rule the World, the art and power of storytelling. Storytelling is what connects us as humans, and for brands, it is no different. A well-told story can effectively position your brand in the minds and hearts of your audience, and can convert thoughts and feelings into results and revenue. On this show, we dive into the unique and recurring principles of world-class storytellers from every walk of life to help you level up your storytelling skills and knowledge to drive real, measurable results for you and your organization. Here's your host, Paul Furlong. Well, hello and welcome to Rule the World, the art and power of storytelling. In this episode, I'm joined by Amy Jill Levine, University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies, Mary Jane Worthen, Professor of Jewish Studies, and Professor of New Testament Studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School and College of Arts and Science. Many of our previous guests have cited Jesus as being the greatest storyteller in history, and so I reached out to Amy Jill, who is considered the world's foremost expert on the parables of Jesus, to find out why. Amy Jill has written many books and articles about this, most notably Short Stories by Jesus, The Misunderstood Jew, and the children's book Who Counts? 100 Sheep, 10 Coins, and Two Sons. In this episode, we talk about why context and location is important to your story, and how using the element of surprise can make your story provocative and or funny. So, Amy Jill, it's great to have you along today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for that very generous introduction. A lot of our previous guests, when asked who the greatest storyteller ever has been, have answered with Jesus. So, why do you think he was such a great storyteller? Um, The stories that, that he tells to his fellow Jews work in part because they resonate with his audience. If he begins a story by saying there was a man who had two sons, every Jew in the audience goes, oh, yeah, we, we've sort of heard that one before because we know about Cain and Abel and Jacob and Esau. So Jesus immediately, by his opening line, draws the audience in and then raises their expectations and then invariably surprises them. And so do you think you can define what uh, a parable is for us? Uh The word parable is a Greek term. Para, you know, from parallel or paradox. It means to set something side by side. And balo means to cast or to throw. So you throw two things next to each other. And uh, parables work like a simile works or a metaphor works. They present a sense of comparison. And in seeing those two things next to each other, the kingdom of God is like um, a mustard seed or a leaven used in baking, we begin to get new insight into both elements of that comparison. So what's the difference between a parable and an allegory? Ah, well, allegories require a one-to-one correspondence between every single element in the story itself and then in the outside world. So if we were to take a a familiar parable like the Good Samaritan, then um, the oil and the wine that the Samaritan uses for medical attention, that becomes the the law and the prophets, uh, and the inn becomes the church, and the, the innkeeper becomes Paul. But the problem with the allegory is it requires an answer key, and therefore allegories can't function as part of popular teaching because the audience is continually going to say, well, what does that represent, or what does this represent? Jesus is not telling parables fully to befuddle his audience and then saying, no, you have to come in for the lesson on the other hand to tell you what it means. The parables have to be open to interpretation. They have to be understandable to the audience that hears them. And parables weren't specific to Jesus, were they? They're they're a big part of Jewish culture. Oh, they're a big part of Jewish culture. Jesus does not invent the form. Um, We have Nathan's parable of the ewe lamb told to King David. We have that wonderful political parable of the trees told by Jotam in the book of Judges. And moreover, there are parables also in in the broader Greek and Roman worlds. Um, We can look at Aesop's fables as part of that general genre. But the other thing about parables that, that makes them distinct here is parables are not banal statements of the obvious. Parables are designed to shake people up, uh, to indict. Uh, They're like a, I like to think of them as a form of heart surgery. They don't tell us something new. They tell us something that we've got deep down repressed. And then Jesus manages brilliantly to open us up with these stories and make us realize how we can be the human beings that God intended us to be. And so is that why you think that Parables are so powerful, um, and why, why particularly Jesus' parables are still told today? Do you think that's it, or do you think there are other elements to that as well? Ah, well, the, you've actually asked two different questions. Is that what makes them powerful? Yes. Um, is that what makes them popular? Not necessarily. 
Because I think what happens today too often is is we wind up either allegorizing the parables or domesticating them or taming them, and we wind up making them kind of banal and, in fact, kind of boring. Oh, it's, you know, the prodigal son again. Because what we wind up doing is we resist the provocation. We resist the hard teaching. And the provocation you, you, you've talked about, and I wonder if you can expand on a little bit, is um, it's about reframing uh, and tapping into memories rather than necessarily revealing something new or teaching something new in the listeners. Tapping into memories, tapping into our general sense of, of what may, makes a moral action or an ethical person. So, For example, um, today most readers identify with the Samaritan, so we are the good Samaritan, and we have good Samaritan hospitals and, and Samaritan's person. Samaritans are just lovely. Uh, back in the first century, it, it, for a group of Jews, the idea of good Samaritan would have sounded oxymoronic. Um, Samaritans were not the oppressed minority, they were the enemy. So people in the first century most likely would have imagined themselves to be the person in the ditch and thought the Samaritan is coming toward me. He's going to kill me. He's going to attack me. He's going to make it worse. And then we have to realize that the enemy is the one person who's going to save us. And that's really hard to do. And so you talk in your book, um, uh, Short Stories by Jesus, about the fact that Jesus really explained the meaning of his parables. He just left them hanging which is something that um, when I was talking to Bill Phillips about NLP and, and metaphor, they don't uh, ever explain the metaphor that they're telling, whereas other people have said, yeah, you need to explain, you need to come up with the macro point of the story. So why, does, uh, why doesn't Jesus uh, explain the, the meaning of his parables? The vast majority of parables do not come with interpretations. That's, that's in part what makes them such good stories. Jesus has enough respect for his audience to let the audience make the conclusions on their own. I mean, I think that's brilliant. On occasion, we get explanations in the Gospels, and the parables only show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John can be looked at as one giant parable. Um, Every once in a while, Luke comes in and gives us an explanation, and those explanations, um, they turn the parables into allegories, and and they make them so much less interesting. Um, So a story that's left open-ended, a story that will cause people to continue to talk about it and to chew over it, And to debate, well, you know, what do you get out of it? Or what does your neighbor get out of it? That's the sign of a really good story, is that people will continue to talk about it. And can you tell us a little bit about how um, the context um, of the parables is so important to understand? You talked about how um, we we tend to make them a bit more banal now, talk to children and and use them there, which is not not a bad thing in itself. But um, can you explain how important context is to the stories that Jesus was telling? Yeah. There are two different contexts we have to worry about. There's the literary context, like where does the parable show up in the gospel text? And then there's the historical contextualized context. You know, what, what are first century Jews thinking if somebody gets up and says, uh, you know, which man among you having a hundred sheep? Um, are they thinking some poor shepherd or are they thinking some high end sheep owner? So the more we know about the historical context, the more we're able to pick up the edginess of the parable. And more than that, Because the parables have been interpreted for a good 2,000 years, um, we can strip out some of the unfortunate misunderstandings of Jesus' context uh, and thereby uh, strip out some of the negative negative and false readings of parables that have come through. For example, um, first century Jewish fathers, as far as we know from every text we've got, are hands-on, caring, loving, and concerned about their kids. And we know that in part from the Gospels, like fathers bring Uh, sick children to Jesus or bring Jesus to sick children uh, so that the child could be healed. Uh, They bring children to Jesus so that Jesus can place his hands on them and bless them and so on. Children are highly valued. But what has happened so much in Christian interpretation is that we read, for example, in the prodigal son, oh, the dad never would have accepted that younger son back. He would have made the younger son grovel and all that. And then the surprise of the parable is that dad welcomes the younger son back. Um, That's not a good first century Jewish reading of that story. Uh, First century Jews, they're looking at that older brother who they expect to be like Cain or like Esau. Um, And it turns out the older brother winds up being the sympathetic character. And then the father's concern in that historical context is, now that I've ignored my older son, now that I've thrown this party, 
And and the older brother's out in the field and he hears the sound of music and dancing and he has to ask what happened. And it suddenly occurs to the dad, oh, nobody invited the older brother. Maybe he's the one who's lost. Now we can get a good historical reading of how profound that parable is. And how do you suppose that translates to when we're telling stories in the modern day to the context that we provide when we're telling stories? Yeah. Well, stories will always be retold. And every time we retell them, we have to figure out what the context is. Um, in, in the same way, you can you can reset a Shakespearean play in, in 1920s New York. Um, uh, so we can reset the parable of, of the prodigal son in, in, in the, the 21st century in London. Um, how much the new context influences the story, that will depend upon the storyteller. Um, when, when my friend Sandy Eisenberg Sasso and I reset the three parables in Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son into a children's book, uh, we set that in, in a completely modern context. Sometimes you can do it, but you have to be careful because you don't want to lose the historical provocation. And uh, I'm glad that you've used the word provocation there because I wanted to talk about how um, Jesus made the parables very provocative. Mm -hmm. So how did he go about that and why was it necessary for him to make the, the parables provocative? Ah, well, whether it was necessary or not, I don't know. It's something, something that he chose to do. Um, I don't think he was getting an audience by telling parables, right? If you, if you get up, you know, on the seashore or, or in a building and say, oh, by the way, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a fellow who sows mustard. I don't think you're going to get much of an audience. Um, but Jesus already has credibility as a storyteller because he's got credibility on other fronts. I mean, I do think he was healing. I do think he, he was um, performing exorcisms, as people would have understood that back then. Um, I think he had that type of charismatic personality where people would listen to him and say, yeah, this is a man who speaks with authority and I need to listen. And then the parables come in. So they're already front loaded with Jesus' own abilities on other fronts. Um, what he manages to do so brilliantly is he takes perfectly mundane images and then he allows the, he allows the listener, which includes us, um, to see those things in another way. Um, so when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he doesn't have to talk about pearly gates and golden slippers and, and choirs of angels. But he can suggest that the, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who, who, hides, who, hides, who hides leaven in a lot of dough. And a perfectly mundane image, but then you realize uh, the the dough that she's using is, is sixty pounds of flour. I don't know what that is in kilograms, maybe forty kilograms. That's a lot of flour. And you say, "Oh, that's that's extraordinary." And then you begin to look around and say, "Maybe the kingdom of heaven can be found at the communal oven of a Galilean village where everybody has enough to eat, or maybe the kingdom of heaven is encoded in in mustard seed and in yeast and in fields. It's right here." if you can just open your eyes and see it. And you talk in, in your book as well about how often the parables were amusing or funny or entertaining to the listeners as well. And it might be the fact that I don't necessarily understand the context of some of them. I've, I've never really laughed at the parable, I have, have to admit. So um, can you explain how Jesus uses humor uh, within the parables as well um, to, to keep the audience engaged? Humor is frequently historically contextualized. So a joke that works in the first century might not work in the 21st because we're not picking up the codes. Um, it, I find most of the parables really quite funny. And one of them that, that I, I continually laugh at when I hear it um, is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, and I, I probably ought not to be laughing at this parable because, I mean, it is talking about a man who's suffering in hellfire. Uh, but when Lazarus, the rich man, calls up to Father Abraham, hey, can you send Lazarus to dip his finger into some cool water because it's basically hot as hell here? Um, and, and this poor rich man who is so clueless, he hasn't realized that Lazarus is actually in heavenly bliss, and it's not Lazarus's job to provide him a cup of water. I just think that's funny. And then he calls to Abraham, well, you know, maybe you could send Lazarus to visit my brothers, but no concern for everybody else, still just that concern for the family, so that the poor rich man, even after he's damned, still doesn't get it. So there's also uh, 
and you've picked up on this already, but I wonder if you can talk about it a little bit more. There's an element of surprise used in the parables, and you've mentioned about the, the good Samaritan. Um, mm-hmm. but can, you, can you talk a little bit more about how Jesus uses the element of surprise in the stories, which does feed back into the humor and, and the provocation as well a little bit? Right. There's a surprise and a delight. And then what happens is at the same time we're being indicted, we're also laughing. And that's just brilliant in terms of storytelling. Um, it, it, mustard seed does not grow into a giant tree and birds of heaven nest in its branches. And this is a completely bizarre image. Um, but Jesus has credibility, so we have to work with with the image. Um, it, it's unlikely uh, that, that a, a Samaritan is going to stop and help somebody by the road. That, that very idea is shocking. Uh, but then Jesus gives the Samaritan details. He stops, he has compassion, he takes time for medical attention, and then he brings the guy on his donkey to an inn in Jericho. And he says to the innkeeper, basically, here are a couple of coins, here are two denarii. Uh, take care of him and, and I'll, I'll pay you whatever, which basically means, hey, innkeeper, I'm coming back. I'm going to check on you. And now the poor innkeeper is involved in this thing, in which originally he had, he had no concern. So the Samaritan winds up roping in other people to help care for the injured man. I just think that's brilliant. And I also think it's funny. You mentioned that in, in your books that um, the location of where Jesus told his stories was important as well. It often wasn't in the synagogue or in the temple. It was usually usually involved food. It's usually around <laughs> the, the, the kitchen table or, or around a picnic. C- can you talk about how the, the location of... of telling a story is so important as well. Yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm actually, I don't think they had kitchen tables back then, but um, uh, it, he's going to tell stories, I think, wherever he happens to be, because that's part of what he does. It's a, it's a form of his instruction. Um, but then the gospel writers have to figure out where to set the parables. And I think that Jesus, I think he repeated some of them. I mean, in the same way that a, a musician who has a signature song is going to repeat it in whatever venue she happens to be singing. Um and then the gospel writers have to know he did it here or he did it there. Um, Jesus in the gospels, in all four gospels, spends much of his time eating. Uh, <laughs> so he, and he's eating with it, quite indiscriminately, you know, with Pharisees or with tax collectors and sinners or with the people on the road or with five thousand by the seashore. Um, so if you're eating then it would make sense that you would tell parables that have to do with food um, and with forms of agriculture, like mustard seed. Um, and mustard's wonder. People knew about mustard back then. Mustard was used for seasoning. Mustard was used for medical concerns or uh, producing an enormous amount of bread. And then as people were eating, they're literally ingesting the story. And that also makes for good storytelling because the next time somebody has, you know, a hot dog with mustard, they didn't have hot dogs back then either. Um, but it was, oh, I'm tasting the mustard. I remember the parable. I'm tasting the bread. I remember the parable. Uh, I'm hearing about Lazarus reclining on the breast of Abraham. That's a dining scene when you recline on somebody's breast. So now I can imagine that heavenly banquet, but it's right here when I'm eating with my fellows. How fabulous is that? And you mentioned there that Jesus may have repeated the stories. It's not like he just told the Good Samaritan story once and then never spoke of it again. Um, oh, I think if you have a good story, you're going to repeat it. Yep. <laughs> and um, he may have told it slightly differently depending on the audience that was listening. So how important is it to know the audience that you're talking to and how important was it for Jesus to change the, the elements of each story depending on who was listening? Um, I do think good storytellers, as, as well as good university lecturers, adapt whatever they have to say to the needs the needs of the people who were there. Um, and one might certainly drop in particulars. And uh, the parable of the lost sheep gets told differently in Luke and in Matthew. Um, we have to worry about, you know, did the sheep go astray, in which case you could make that sheep into a sinner because sinners go astray. But in Luke's version, um, where there's Luke has set up a multiple audience, and this may well be Luke's audience, uh, there are Pharisees and tax collectors, and there are sinners and there are disciples. I mean, there's a mixed audience. And Jesus begins, which man among you having a hundred sheep? Well, at that point, people who are well off are going to hear the story in a way differently than people who might be poor. The sheep owner will hear something differently than the shepherd. And it turns out the man who has lost, he has a hundred sheep and he's lost one. Now, you need to know the context to know how that functions. If you have a hundred sheep and you lose one, how do you know 
Um, because you can't just look up and say, oh, I'm missing a sheep. They all look alike. You know, you can't say it was the sheep with the beret or the sheep with the kilt. Um, so you have to go, you have to count them and you have to put them through a sheepfold. Um, and then you realize I've, I've, I've lost a sheep. And then this man frantically goes out and finds the sheep. It's a funny scene over Hill and Dale. And he picks up the sheep and he puts it on his shoulders. And, you know, 60 pound you, the smell alone would knock you out. And at the end, he calls up all of his friends and neighbors and says, yeah, I'm, I'm having a party. Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. OK, pretty much everybody in the audience, they're not going to care. Right. You just lost a sheep. You found it. Why would the neighbors care? And are certain people thinking, oh, maybe they're having lamb chops that night for dinner. The more you know about that context, the funnier the parable becomes, the more absurd the searching becomes. And if you shift the context you'll get a different reading. Just one quick example. Um, I have a friend who does a lot of teaching in Tanzania. And she told me that when she first told this parable to some of her students in Tanzania, and these, these are folks who own sheep, they say, oh, well, if a sheep goes astray, we shoot it because other sheep might follow it. And I'm thinking, okay, is that going to work in Jesus' context? Now I have to change the story a little bit. You also um, compare some of the parables of Jesus to Mr. Potato Head. Oh, I do, yes. You do. <laughs> Could you explain yeah. that a little bit, please? In England? I mean, is that a cross-cultural toy? Um, I think we know it mostly because of Toy Story. Ah, yes. One tries to find whatever metaphor will work in order to make something academically clear. Um, in, in Mr. Potato Head and now Ms. Potato Head, um, the potato remains consistent, but you can put on different eyes and different noses and different collars and different ears and different hairstyles and whatnot. I think the parable outline remains consistent. So the story outline will be consistent. The story of Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty, it's all consistent. Uh, but you put on different elements. So the shoe is made of glass for Cinderella or the shoe is made of fur. Um, I think for Jesus, is there's a consistent storyline about a lost sheep and the finding of the sheep and the rejoicing. But then you might put on different elements depending upon which audience is listening at which particular time. What we have in the Gospels, um, I, I think we, we can still find those structural outlines. I think we can still find the potato, but it may well be that a Gospel writer might have added something here or there. For example, Matthew tends to make some of the, the difficult parables more violent. Uh, so the wedding banquet parable for Matthew, I mean, there's a mass slaughter at the end. Luke doesn't have that. And I have a feeling that's Matthew adding on a little bit to the potato that he was initially served. So the, obviously the parables that Jesus told weren't written down directly by Jesus. They were written down by the gospel writers. Or somebody prior to the gospel writers, because we don't know whether the gospel writers are operating off text or whether they're operating off oral tradition or some combination thereof. So the stories that we're getting, how different do you think they've become in that translation? Because you talk about Matthew adding a certain element to it, Luke looking at it slightly differently. Um, because stories tend to remain constant, because that potato always remains a potato, um, I have a feeling is they, they move through the oral tradition and from the original Aramaic in, into the Greek of the New Testament and then into our English translations. I think in the same way that folk tales and fairy tales tend to remain the same as structural outline, the parables remain the same as well. However, um, there are a number of biblical scholars who think that Luke invented a number of the parables that are distinct to Luke, and they don't go back to Jesus at all. Uh, so Luke invented invents the prodigal son, and Luke invents the good Samaritan and all that. Um, I don't think that's the case. Uh, but again, that, that has to remain something shrouded in mystery. We don't know. And you said earlier on that the parables appear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they don't appear in John. But John is, John is essentially a parable in itself. Can you explain what you meant by that? Sure. Um, if a parable functions as a comparison where the story tells you something about the world as you inhabit it, so you don't just stay in the story, but somehow you actualize that story in your own life, um, then we can look at Jesus in the Gospel of John using language, using story in order to help us see the world differently, which is what parables do. So that in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus uses mundane language, but language which always has a second meaning. Uh, 
running water is living water. It's the same expression. Um, or talking about the spirit, but the spirit is just wind. So when you get done, at least when I get done reading the Gospel of John, everything everything in the world is, is heightened. It's more shimmery so that the breeze I feel on my cheek, that could actually be the Holy Spirit. Or if I hear tap water running, that could be the Holy Spirit as well. So by using language in, in a multiple and heightened and indeed provocative way, Jesus in the Gospel of John is speaking parables into existence and showing us the world that we see, our, our just quotidian mundane world. There's something more there. And the Gospel of John, reading that story, helps us unlock that something more. Obviously, you've re- written a huge amount of uh, texts Uh, You sent me your CV and said not to print it out. I thought it was going to be four or five pages. I think it was 78 pages of all the things that things that you've written. Um, So obviously there's there's an element of storytelling when you're writing all of your papers and your books and everything else. How do you find it different between writing for, say, uh, university and academic um, writings compared to writing books like um, short stories by Jesus or by writing your children's books like Who Counts 100 Sheep, 10 Coins and Two Sons. Yeah, well, I, I'm old. I've been doing this a long time. Um, and when I first started writing, I sounded very academic and it was very pretentious. And I had to have, you know, German uh, and Latin and Greek and Hebrew in every sentence. And, uh, but I was also talking to church groups and to synagogue groups and to uh, uh, youth groups and I was teaching, and I realized you can't sound all that hoity-toity. I mean, it, you know, it's it's not terribly interesting, and it's really not needed. And I I got increasingly tired of of academic obscurantism. You know, let me use a bunch of big words to make me sound important. I thought, how dumb is that? Um, you know, I, I'm a I'm a biblical scholar, yeah, but the Bible is story. Uh, the Bible should be able to be accessed and understood. Uh, by people who take it as sacred scripture. Um, And I, as somebody who works in this area, should be equally understandable. Um, So I had an editor at one point when I was working on Misunderstood Jew who said, just write the way you talk. (laughs) I thought, yeah, I can do that. Um, So as as I've gotten older, um, pretty much what I write, I can save all that academic jargon for the footnotes and just write a text that should be comprehensible uh, to my children who are not biblical scholars or to my in-laws who are not biblical scholars. And how did you find writing a, a children's book? How, how was that particularly really difficult? difficult. <laughs> um, so I, I was lamenting with my, with my friend Sandy Sasso, who is also, by the way, a rabbi, uh, about the lack of good children's books on Jesus. They're either boring or they're anti-Jewish or they're both. And Sandy, who is a prize-winning, well-published children's book author, said, oh, let's do a book on Jesus. And I said, well, let's do the parables because, you know, they're good children's stories, or they can be. It's really hard. Um, For the first book, and and we have have one more now in press on the mustard seed, and we're right now working on the Good Samaritan. It's back and forth and back and forth 30, 40 times because with children's books, every word matters. And with an adult book, every once in a while, you can throw in a footnote or you can put in a bibliography. You cannot do that with children's books. Um, We don't want to dumb down to kids. Uh, We're writing for the three to seven set. So we have to have illustrations and that makes a difference as well. So it's counterintuitive to me because I'm used to having as many words as I want. Um, And to go from saying, here, have 100,000 words to having 1,000 words. Oh, that's hard. Um, I think the shorter material you write, the harder it is, because you have to be so precise. <laughs> so what have you learned from it that you'll take back into, say, your academic writing and your writing for adults? Um, what I've learned um, is that you can convey the same message to adults that you can convey to kids, uh, but sometimes it's easier to do it with pictures, and, and sometimes pictures get in the way. So I've, I've learned the, the difficulties as well as the benefits of the artistic accompaniment to words, because I'm, I'm a, a word crafter rather than a picture drawer. Um, I've learned that certain words work very, very well with adults and they don't work with kids. Um, certain puns work and sometimes they don't. Um, I've learned that one can joke about politics with adults. That's probably inappropriate for kids. Um, and Sandy has taught 
me so much about what kids can take, because I was very worried about um, having a, a sense where kids might want to take a moral lesson or an ethical lesson. Um, and Sandy kept saying, don't dumb down. Kids are ethical beings and you can provoke them and you can even indict them. And they are strong enough people, even at three or four, to understand what good behavior is and what bad behavior is. They're strong enough to know what it's like to be ignored and to voice that. And therefore, they're strong enough to know what happens when they ignore somebody else. So just a couple of quick fire questions, if that's all right, um, because I'm sure. aware of time. So um, when, this is the question that when I ask everyone else, they say the answer to Jesus. So um, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus can't be your answer. So other than Jesus, who do you think of when you hear the word story and why? Oh, well, I, I actually don't start with Jesus. <laughs> I, may, I may be your outlier. Um, I think the stories in, in the Bible, the stories in what the church would call the Old Testament are the best stories in the world. Um, that's what attracted me to biblical studies in the first place, uh, because they leave open so much uh, and they pack so much in there. So you keep digging to try to figure out what they're saying. And then they continually give rise to other stories. Um, so we have not st stopped telling the story of Adam and Eve. We have not stopped telling the story of King David or of Moses or of Rachel or Esther or Ruth. And they continue to speak to us today. So that when I'm in the synagogue and I'm listening to those texts being read in Hebrew, and I'm just marveling um, over the depth of the language and the multiple ways that they can be interpreted, I think one of the reasons Jesus is the good storyteller that he is, is because he grew up on those stories and he learned from those stories. And can you re recommend any good books or websites or blogs or podcasts or anything like that that might help us become better at storytelling other than reading and learning from the Old Testament? Oh, well, there's my stuff you can certainly of course. <laughs> It does sound a little self-serving. Um, I read all the time. Uh, I listen to books on tape uh, because it's very hard for me to read novels or short stories because as an academic, I'm always wanting to take out that red pen and say, oh, no, there's a split infinitive here or this is the wrong word. Um, but I like the idea of listening to stories. And I, I, I have to say the one that grabbed me, I listened on tape to all of Game of Thrones. I thought it was just splendid. Uh, because it gives me different forms of dialogue, different ways that characters express themselves, and lots and lots of background detail that I found absolutely fascinating. So if somebody can construct a new world, how marvelous is that? And then finally, uh, where can we find your books? Where can we find out more about you online, uh, websites, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that? Um, well, I, I have a Facebook page, but I don't know how it works. <laughs> My daughter actually takes care of it. Um, technology somewhat boggles me. If people want to see what I've written, they can access my curriculum vitae uh, at the Vanderbilt University website, um, or they can just go on Amazon and look me up. I am apparently there. Um, <laughs> I can attest to that. I found, uh, yeah. <laughs> I found your books on there and uh, purchased a couple of them to do the prep for today. So you're definitely there on Amazon. Yeah, and I'm pretty easy to follow. So for an audience in UK, I will be at Limud, which is a, a major, the Limud Festival, which is a major Jewish gathering, you know, something Jews can do over Christmas. Um, and, and I'll be in Ireland uh, at the beginning of December, working with my Roman Catholic friends over there. So I mean, I, I travel fairly often. And if people want to come invite me to tell them stories about Jesus, I am more than happy to get on a plane and do so. Brilliant. Well, thank you uh, for today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and uh, helping us to be better at storytelling. Well, what fun to talk with you. Thank you. I shall speak to you soon. Thanks very much, AJ. Most welcome. Thank you for joining us for this episode of All the World. Be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show and visit weareopusmedia.com for more resources based on today's topic as well as access to more episodes that will help you develop your storytelling abilities. That's weareopusmedia.com. Thank you and see you next time.